So they brought me down like 15 minutes ago and then told me there was a 10 minute break. So they had the judges icing me backstage. Um, which, it was kind of a blessing in disguise, actually. I got to hang out with Chuck, the, uh, the mic wrangler, who's awesome. If you guys haven't, you guys all have mics, so you've met Chuck. Uh, what he was telling me is, I haven't heard your presentation yet, but I'm looking really forward to it. I'll be listening from the wings, so shout out to my boy Chuck. Uh, and he said, I'm a 1099er and I've been getting nailed by taxes. Everybody knows they suck. That is what he said to me not five or six minutes ago, which is really cool, and I, I wasn't surprised because one in three individuals are earning 1099 income today. One in three, that's 30% of the US workforce, which means 53 million Americans earning 1099 income. Over the next couple years, that number will grow to 65 million Americans. 40% of our workforce, which is absolutely incredible. And I see Gary saying that's probably gonna be higher than that. Probably so, but that's a conservative estimate. And what we know is these people are self-employed. They're out there on their own. They have no infrastructure, no benefits. They don't have a W-2 employer. Nobody separating taxes, nobody giving them health care, no benefits. They're getting absolutely nailed and they're out there on a limb building the backbone of America. It's, in, it's crazy. But this big number is hard to wrap a name and a face around, so I'll introduce you to my friend Beth. She's a real estate agent, a speaker, a consultant. I've done some work with her. She is superwoman, and she runs into some super crucial problems throughout her day living a life and making a living for herself, her family, her dogs running around. This is the first one, taxes. As Chuck said, as Beth knows, they are absolutely incredibly confusing. You gotta beat the learning curve, or you gotta figure out how to pay somebody to handle them, right? 40% of freelancers, individuals who are self-employed, cite this as either number one or number two problem in living in this world. And then the second problem, saving. Beth is not alone in having this problem because we know 68, almost 70% of Americans couldn't cover a $500 emergency today. Setting money aside is one of the hardest things we can do just psychologically. 10, 15% of people have the capacity to put money aside and not touch it. W-2 withholding does that beautifully because you never see the money come in. But when you're 1099, self-employed, you get a whole chunk and you're supposed to separate it and do things with it. That's hard, especially when you're juggling the life of self-employment, invoicing, finding clients, managing expectations. It is absolutely insane. And that's why we built Painless 1099. It's a smart bank account that automates the way people set aside money for their self-employment taxes. It's a smart bank account, algorithm attached, that you get direct deposit into as a Painless 1099 user. We separate your taxes, and then we kick the rest into your personal checking account. It's just like W-2 withholding for the 53 million Americans who are floating out there, again, out on a limb with no HR infrastructure. It's huge, and that's what we're doing for these people. But really, what we're really doing outside of the nuts and bolts is this. We're the HR department, the real infrastructure for these people. And that is important because I mentioned they're building our country. Net new jobs, job creation, entrepreneurs. It's these guys and they don't have infrastructure. That's what we've built. This is the problem. It's actually the current solution. That's what Beth gets to deal with. She has to figure out how to manage these solutions and they actually add more work to her plate. She does more work to do this where she really should be doing something like this. Just automating the whole process. Why manually punch in numbers and give information to these platforms when we know exactly when you get paid, how much you should be separating, and what to do with it? That's what we've done with Painless 1099, is taking the manual labor out of something that should be automated so Beths of the world, the yous of the world, the me and my partners who have lived in this world can go back to focusing on what we know and we love and automate the rest. And they're people that we know. These are the 1099ers across the board. These are our nephews, our nieces, our moms, our dads, our, our sisters and brothers. These are the 99 designers, the creatives. Everybody knows a creative. Everybody knows a real estate agent. They're the Uber drivers, the guys who are hosting on Airbnb. These are the people living in pretty, pretty large enterprises and even larger industries. And we've identified some verticals. These are three of them on the slide. But there are verticals across the board. You've got contract attorneys, nurses, truck drivers, real estate agents, your on-demand economy. There are massive industries that we've identified and can plug into and have started building solutions. Dreamtown Realty right there in the middle is uh, one of my favorites because they're our first enterprise client. They do a billion in transactions, over 300 brokers, and we integrated directly into their dashboard. We gave these guys a solution that they can't legally provide to their contractors because of classification, and as a third party, we can do that and make their lives easier. We make it easier to hire agents because they have this solution, and make it easier to retain agents when they avoid the nightmare of an unexpected tax bill. That's what we do, and we can do this across verticals and replicate that to scale. 
How do we get to these people? B2C is, is interesting, it's easy. I put Facebook and Twitter up, not because we're tweeting to people, because this is the infrastructure that self-employed individuals have hacked together. We live on Twitter, we live on Facebook. These are the tools to communicate with our peers. And then on the distribution side, B2B ultimately to C, going to the enterprises who have been looking for a solution. Yuval and Peter at Dreamtown told me when I came to them with this, we've been looking for something like this for 15 years. We've created a solution that helps people and again, it plugs in where the enterprises aren't allowed to offer a solution. Uber can't offer a solution here. It kills their business model. As soon as those employees go to W2, they have no business model, but we can offer a solution that handles some of these problems. So how do we make money? Subscriptions, really easy. Upfront, that is a pretty, pretty reasonable price point given some of the other tax solutions out there. And then the beauty of what we've done is assets held. Just by virtue of having money in our accounts, we're making interest. And then lastly, this is a lead generation tool. This is what moves the needle for us when we get to scale. Banks are paying four to 500 bucks to get a user on. I can get them for 50 to 100 in a seemingly innocuous savings account. From there, financial institutions can start selling insurance, mortgages, a ton of products around what they've started as a tax savings account. And as we start getting into that, we can split the difference with these institutions. Everybody across the board wins. So that's a scale play. And scale's important because we've done it before. Justin, myself, and Matt, outside of living in academia and working and building programs at universities, uh, we built a product called Coffitivity one of Time's top 50 sites of the year in 2013. We're sitting at just under four million users across all but five countries in the world. We've done scale, we know how to build a product that people love and come back to, and to this day we sit at 50% return rate on that project alone. But it helps to note that we don't know everything. While we can do scale and experience really well, we've surrounded ourselves with some industry experts, and these are just a handful. Brian did 23 years as a partner at Price Waterhouse. Mike is a VP of Ops at Cap One. Marty, international executive at MasterCard, and then Joe, VP of strategy and marketing at CarMax. These are massive global brands, and they've helped us position ourselves to get into being one that is comparable in size. And that's really important. And the beauty of being here in Buffalo is we can extend that network and continue to rack up mentors who can help us build through regulation and, and some of the nuances and technicalities that come up in the banking and tax space. So with that team, we've knocked out some crucial milestones. The first one being having a banking partner on board. This is one of the biggest, if not the biggest barrier to doing what we do. Being able to create this backbone and this infrastructure is crucial and having a banking partner to automate account opening and do the savings component for us is really what we had to knock out and we were able to do that partly because of what we built as a team before and also because of what we've been able to, to demonstrate to them from a regulation, security, and compliance side with the help of our mentors and the team that we have. The bank approval, again, compliance, security, huge. We've knocked those things out. And our bank feels really good about rolling this out to the masses because we've demonstrated our processes are in place. And again, one of the hardest things to do. Traction, first user and deposits are rolling through the system now, and that is crucial for us as we've been able to tweak the experience in our beta class and we're prepping to roll out into an open market. And then the first contract, I mentioned Dreamtown Realty and those guys looking for a solution. We've identi identified real estate as a great market to start. We can replicate that and push a throttle as we nail down experience and roll out of our beta phase. And then the question is, What's coming up next? We just wrapped up a friends and family round. We've got ramp into a seed round. And that allows us to build out a product roadmap. Coming back to experience and making something people love, making something that automates a crucial part of people's lives is big for us and expense tracking, tax filing, and the mobile experience being optimized is huge and that allows us to do that. And of course, scaling to enterprise partners and more users is what allows us to build this HR backbone and make sure people have the infrastructure to live, make a living, and do what they love and focus less on what they don't. So we're doing this for guys like us, we're doing it for people like you who've lived in this world and been self-employed, and we're doing it for the best of the world. You know, I had a user come up to me and he was like, dude, it works like magic, and when I said, no, it's just math, man, but I think what's really important, and that's what he was telling me, is that we truly do make this experience of handling taxes painless. So, thank you. Well done. Appreciate Mike it. Mike Lazaro, you hired tons and tons of people. <laughs> First question is yours. Yeah, so my question is there's a company called Zen99, which was doing pretty much the same thing. They went out of business. What did they do wrong 
that you're going to do right? Uh, that's a great question. So Tristan at Zen99, the, the CEO over there, he and I were going back and forth chatting. And, and what we kind of figured out is they handled a lot of some of the nitty gritty, whereas we handled the big problem, which was saving. Uh, and I think as founders, we have a nasty habit of thinking our competitors are stupid. That's never the case. Um, so in talking to Tristan, what, what he realized is they started at one point and tried to pivot to another point. And I think after seeing what those guys did, we started at a different tact, which was automating the savings portion rather than starting at expenses. And so seeing how they struggled a little bit and talking to Tristan, reading his postmortem on uh, Medium, I don't know if you caught that, uh, and then chatting through really the regulation and banking infrastructure, which again, our mentors have helped us navigate. We got over some of the hurdles that after they pivoted, they were trying to navigate. And I think it was just a little too little, a little too late. That's fair. So you were uh, talking a little bit about your referral platform uh -huh. and attacking kind of small, medium businesses and contractors has always been really expensive. So very few companies have been able to go after that, you know, kind of uh, very small business because of the cost of doing it. Why are you going to be any different from all the other people who have broken their pick on that segment of the market? What's your CAC? What's the you know, yeah. cost of acquisition for you? Yeah, great question. So one, I kind of mentioned the B2C. I think there's an opportunity to back into the enterprises. You know, getting to scale at the individual user level, which we've demonstrated we can do and have already started doing with this product. And then use Uber as an example. You know, we lock up a ton of Uber drivers, and then we go to Uber and say, look, this is how many of your people are already using this platform. It's automating something that, that they should be looking at. All we want you to do is make this available to them. And I think the, the second piece is the enterprise is never going to pay for this product. You know, so taking a free product and saying, look, it makes it easier to hire people. It makes it easier to keep them. When an Uber driver gets nailed on taxes, they don't attribute that pain point to the IRS. They say, hey, it sucked driving for Uber. You know, that may not be the case, but that's, what that's what's happening in their head. And being able to say, hey, we help you mitigate that problem allows us, it's just kind of a no-brainer. Well, I understand, you yeah. know, uh, you gotta let your value them. proposition to, to those guys, to the users, mm -hmm. but how are you going to get to them? How are you going to convince individuals to sign up with you, and, and why is it scalable? I mean, you, you referred to that several times, but... Yeah. Um, uh, so on the messaging piece, how do we get people to sign up with us? Um, you know, we, we actually tried and did not do well at scaring people into it. Hey, the IRS is going to come after you. Uh, what we did do well, and we kind of, we had to pivot from that. Uh, what we started telling people is, hey, you have so much on your plate. Let us automate something you don't know. Tell them where. And so it's, say that again. Tell them where, right? I think you're looking for the details. Yeah. So tell them where. Yeah, so Twitter and Facebook, just organically, you know, we put up, we actually put up a couple paid ads, but really people were finding us as they were searching. And then I, I had Google AdWords on there, really optimizing for intent. You know, people don't know that we exist. What they do know is that they have to figure out how to do taxes. I mean, death and taxes, right? It's one of those things that you can't avoid. And so making sure we're in the stream on Facebook and some of the social media platforms, but especially when they start searching. They say, hey, how do I handle self-employment taxes? Being right there at the top and optimizing for that, I think is gonna be really big. Why, why is this not a feature of a bank, right? So I, you know, you're right, I, I went up higher yeah. because this market is gonna be much, much bigger over time, which is gonna then take the attention of banks in that direction very quickly. And the thought of letting you make the VIG on that instead of creating this feature, because how, how old's the company? Uh, almost a year. Right, so the thought of like getting great engineers to replicate the tool mm -hmm. within a year just seems like a very smart value prop of any bank to just have this as a feature, I'll as a great go-to-market strategy for a acquiring more users versus giving you the big. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So banks have the infrastructure to do this. I mean, when we talk about the competitive landscape, it's financial them. institutions is right it's there. It's them. Right? So we know a couple things. One, banks play not to lose. They don't necessarily play to win, and they're really slow in how they do things. Right? Something we say around the shop is how do we make it suck less than a bank? Right. Frankly, that's not the worst thing or the hardest thing in the world to do. And so it's an experience thing. It's how do we get people in? And you know, that's where banks are thinking about. They have the acquisition tool. Uh, but for us, it's making sure that people love it. And with the infrastructure that exists, people would be doing this already. I mean, do you guys, do you guys look at the financial institutions as the possible acquirer of the business that's, as a feature? Yeah, financial institutions <laughs> aren't into it. I mean, as far as acquisition goes, it's prove the model and let somebody buy us. Yes, yeah. makes sense. So what, what is the business mix between, um, the revenue mix between subscription and uh, interest earning assets? How do you 
Uh, can you give me the breakdown? Uh, so you're earning revenue sure. from the interest income you get right. on the, the float, right. and you're earning revenue on the subscription. What's the, what percentage is which? Yeah, so the plan, and in beta, we're still playing with a lot of those numbers, but the $9 subscription gives us, gives us a fair amount, so that'll be 80% of our revenue. And then you look at, right now, at a couple basis points and work into about 100 um, is the plan for interest. And so as we have assets in the system, that uh, we have a really good, a good way to, to start bumping that interest. But the majority, 80 to 90%, will be on subscription alone. And, and, and I guess the barriers to entry, you know, why isn't H&R Block just going to see that this can work and then they have that customer base already, people who come in to do their taxes? So, yeah, one of, one of the reasons we've actually started chatting with a lot of our competitors, it's like, look, we've positioned something. The way we think about it is Google did search really well. We'll do save really well. If we optimize that, we can go to an H&R block and say, look, you guys have infrastructure. White label what we're doing and plug it into your system. We can be the tax withholding kind of piece or portion for a lot of the people who could be competing with us where they shouldn't. So wouldn't that then be on your slide as a SaaS play for a white label kind of play? Potentially, and I think it's early to the point that we're still figuring it out. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but certainly something to speak to there for a revenue model. I, I think you've just touched on this, but I would like clarification from you so that sure. I don't make an assumption. Is this meant the long-term play to be a savings tool or a full-service solution for the 1099 independent contractor? So a little bit of both. Uh, on the savings side, look, there are people who need to do taxes. But they also don't have unemployment. They don't have the rainy day fund. They don't have the I'm an Uber driver saver new car fund. You know, we've facilitated the way people save. We get their money out of sight, out of mind before they think about it, and then we make sure it's available when they need it for something. So we're collecting kind of top of the funnel 1099 income, and we can kick it out to a bunch of different micro accounts, if you will. So the savings portion is a big piece of the HR infrastructure, but we've also set up the brand as the painless brand. 1099 is the first step. We can do K1, partner kickouts, work the same way, and people get nailed there. Painless K1, painless 401k, painless healthcare, painless insurance. We've kind of optimized what we've done in a little bit of branding now to live in a couple different verticals. So the full HR suite is a long-term goal, but I think saving across the board is a big piece of what doesn't exist. And then I'm less concerned about this, but again, I think you did a good job of telling us what the problem is and what the solution is, but we didn't see anything about UI and UX. Is sure. this an app? Is this online? Like, if you had to say what it looks and functions closest to, what would it be like? Yeah, so currently it is a web app, and I think what's really important is this is set it and forget it right now. Right? People shouldn't be in it all the time. Really, it's the setup and the automation, and then they don't go back to touch it. Uh, so it's a web app currently. There will be a mobile component that is going to be crucial for the expense tracking portion, uh, but by and large, it's you get in, you set up your account, and you go back to work. You really shouldn't be interacting with it, although the UI is, is optimized to have a good experience when you have to. Um, so is that... Does that answer the question? Good when enough, thank you. you. Mail in a check, right? Yes and no, and so that's actually the next leg, as in tandem with expense tracking, is the easy button that goes directly to the IRS. So becoming an authorized <coughs> e-filer allows somebody to log in, click go, and say, hey, I saved 1,500 bucks, it needs to go there, you can do it for me. Uh, I think there's a partnership with an ADP or a payroll provider as well to do the same. Can you just talk for a minute about your hiring plan over the next two years? Like, what, what uh, do you need to add to the team? To yeah, be able to ab roll absolutely. Um, so one of the things we absolutely want to do is have a resident CPA, CPA and residence for sure. Um, and that does two things. It allows people on-demand access, and we can upsell that to the CPA. But it allows us to start playing with the nuances beyond what we've done in our algorithm uh, to make sure, especially multiple filings in multiple states, there are some things that people are going to need help with. Uh, and while the algorithm, uh, algorithm handles it, they'll need to, to speak to that a little bit more in depth. And then from there, I mentioned design, Lauren. That's, that's going to be a big piece, having a UX designer in-house. My partner, Justin, handles it, and he's really good at what he does. But he's also really good at selling into the small businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, so having him out on the streets with me and having a designer at home is going to, to optimize a little bit of how we scale. Uh, so design, CPA, and then from there, as we scale, developers and customer support. So Sucky. Go ahead. Yeah. Just going back to what Andrew said and, and what, what I was also asking before about is this going to be a savings tool or a full service solution? And I think we've talked a lot about savings and we haven't talked about also how it can help perhaps invoicing. Like, do you have any plans to start invoicing so that people, you know, 
also help them keep track of their money so that they're making it to save it? Because not everyone right. is an Uber driver or someone swiping yep. a credit card. Uh, yes, so as I'm running out of time, I'll answer that really quickly. Uh, the big piece here is the savings for a really important reason. I think the landscape for invoicing tools is cluttered. Why play in that space when nobody's doing saving really well? And there are a ton of opportunities to partner with a lot of the players, the fresh books of the world. Uh, and so that's how we're thinking about it now, not to say we won't build it later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done.